really glad to see all of you come out on this beautiful night instead of being at home working in your garden. You're here and we're grateful. Hardwick really is the place to be, isn't it? Woo! I'm Andrea Jones. I'm one of the co-owners at the Galaxy Bookshop with Sandy Scott, my partner. And we're And we're really pleased to be co-sponsoring this event tonight with the Judavine Memorial Library in Hardwick. And if you didn't notice on your way in or if you came in through the side door, um, a couple of things. There's a really beautiful playhouse, suitable for children, but also for adults, that you can get a raffle ticket for out front that supports the expansion project of the Judavine Library. And in the entryway, there's a, a really nice poster that details that expansion project. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, please do. There are refreshments out there by donation, also for the Judavine Library. So if you're feeling a little peckish, have a brownie, a cup of lemonade, leave some cash in the basket for the library. They'd be grateful, we'll be grateful. There are also books for sale. Um, some of you got some on the way in. They'll be for sale again after the event, and Bill will be signing. And I think that's it. I'm going to turn over to Cindy. So I'll, I'll echo Andrea's thanks to all of you for coming out this evening. And um, I wanted to say we're, we're going to have a really interesting uh, format for the evening. It's going to be kind of a conversation happening uh, up here on stage between Linda Ramsdell and Bill McKibben and also a young woman named Kai Gilbert. Um, who is a junior at Hazen Union, and uh, she is the president of the school's green team, working towards uh, create, creating more sustainable programs at the school, and um, she also, she organized the student walkout for climate change at Hazen on March 15th, and that was in solidarity with <laughs>
for a safe clim climate and better future. 350 was one of the first groups to create a global and cohesive movement against the climate crisis. As well as being an intellectual leader and advocate for climate, the climate movement, Bill has also been a part of efforts to disrupt business as usual and has been on the front line of civil disobedience and protests around the world. Inspired by the work of Bill and others, the youth climate justice movement is growing rapidly and gaining more traction and visibility. We are educated. We want change and we want it now. We are united in one voice and we are calling for immediate and drastic change in the global and political response to, climate, to the climate crisis. While we need climate, while we need change in both the political level, we also need change and drastic change on a community level. Bill's new book, Falter, is a call to action. I hope we, as a community, are prepared to take and do the heavy lifting that is required of us to leave this world not just surviving, but thriving. Without further ado, please put your hands together to welcome Mr. Bill McKibben. responsibility of high school juniors to save the planet and the rest of us are going to have to do some work too to back people up so we can maybe talk about that and Linda what a pleasure to get to see you old friend and to um, and and also to know that the galaxy has gone on into good hands and is surviving and thriving <laughs> One of the things that I've written about and talked about over the years a lot is, is local economies and, their, and Hardwick, of course, is an absolute example of how to build a great local economy on all sorts of good pillars, but a bookstore is definitely one of them. And, and I, you know, I, I don't need to say it in this room, but friends do not let friends buy books from Amazon. So, <laughs> Well, speaking of books, let's talk about Falter um, for a little while. Linda, move, yes. the, move the mic closer to your mouth. Right there? Oh, there. Ooh, okay. Yeah. So let's there. talk about the book. <laughs> Thanks, Gudrun. Um, so, Bill, early in this book, you say, a writer doesn't owe a reader hope. The only obligation is honesty, and I'll just say you, you are honest, as far as I can tell. Um, but I, and this is your words again, but I want those who pick up this volume to know that its author lives in a state of engagement, not despair. And later in the book you write, engagement is our only chance. I don't think you ever use the word faith in this book. Yet having read it, I feel you have the deepest faith in humans. What is it about us that gives you that faith, keeps you engaged, and able to ward off despair? Just a little question to get us started. <laughs> well, of course, there are days when, when despair seems in order, you know? Um, and much of this book, as you know, is, is hard. Um, I wrote the first book about climate change 
30 years ago this year it came out. Um, and back then, it was in the nature of a warning. Uh, here's what scientists tell us will happen if we don't change uh, quickly. And then we didn't change quickly or at all. And so everything that scientists told us was going to happen, happened. What do you know? And it happened faster and harder than they said it was going to because scientists are conservative by nature. So there are days when one has no choice sometimes but to doubt a little bit our, our ability as a species. Um, but the more closely that I kind of looked at it and thought about it over the last three decades, it's actually become my contention that it's really only a very small number of our species that's caused most of the problem. Uh, the, the, much of the book is spent on the 30-year highly successful campaign by the fossil fuel industry to mislead and, and, well, and to lie to us about what was happening. And that campaign has been extraordinarily successful. And only now are we beginning, I mean, it's still pretty successful. The President of the United States believes that climate change is a hoax manufactured by the Chinese, a you know position odd enough that if you were sitting on a public bus next to someone muttering it, you would change seats, you know? But, the, um, 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 but for the most part, people are finally beginning to wake up. And it's that waking up that makes me always um, um, think that we'll rise finally at the last possible second to the occasion. We've waited too long to stop climate change. That's no longer on the menu. Um, but we may not have waited too long to slow it to the point where it won't cut the knees out from under our civilization. And, uh, you know, on a day like today, it's possible to believe a lot. I, had, I drove up through Woodbury and Callis, and it was as beautiful as I've ever seen it in Vermont. One of those days when the there's not a bit of moisture in the air, and it looks like you can count every needle on the white pines across the lake, and so on, and it's hard not to be hopeful, and hard not to be hopeful when you meet people like Kai, and there are, as you know now, tens of thousands of you around the country and around the world who are taking up this fight in good order, and, and, and so uh, we'll see. The next five years will tell the story. That's really, seriously, at this point, about how long we've got to make the sort of fundamental transformative change that will send us in a new direction. Uh, right at the moment, we're not yet doing it. We got, at the end of May every year, we get the peak readout of carbon uh, in the atmosphere from that scientific instrument on the side of Mauna Loa that's probably the most important scientific instrument in history, the CO2 register that was put up in 1959. And the CO2 levels peak at the end of May because after that uh, the vegetation growth in the northern hemisphere sucks up some carbon temporarily. And so the peak at the end of May this year was 414.87 parts per million, three and a half parts per million higher than it was the year before, which is the second biggest increase ever in history. 415 parts per million, where we are now, is higher than it's been for 10, 15 million years, so higher than it's been since the beginning of primate evolution. Um, you know, we're in a world of hurt, and our hope now is that, you know, as the planet runs a serious fever, the antibodies emerge, and the antibodies are us, and, and we have the tools now at this point. I mean, the engineers have done their job. They've brought the price of power from the sun and the wind down to the point where it's the cheapest electrons on the planet. If we wanted to make these shifts, we probably could. Um, so we'll see. Uh, so that's about as provisional uh, dose of hope and optimism as it's, you know, as I'm, you know, willing to offer. But I haven't slow down or given up in the kind of effort to get something done and and I'll let you know if I do. You know, I'll call and say from now on we can just retire and ski on what snow there is left and that will be that, you know. But
for the moment we've got to fight to fight. And can you talk then about what you call the human game and about, you, you talked a little bit in your answer to the last question about uh, what you talk about, the size of the board and leverage. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about sure. a little bit more about what makes this moment sure. so critical? Sure. And what, having talked about uh, the less savory sides of humanity, what the more, what the greater qualities sure. that make us human Absolutely. are that will possibly make it happen. So, so one of the, uh, the, the subtitle of the book is Has the Human Game Begun to Play Itself Out? And it's a kind of deliberately ambiguous idea, the human game. I think the thing that appeals to me about it as, an, as a kind of uh, 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 phrase is simply that uh, like the best games, there's no real point to it. Like, what is the point of all of us being alive on this planet? It's hard to come up with the kind of end goal to which we're all working. The kind of point is to keep it going, you know, um, um, because it's kind of wonderful. Um, and it's getting, it's going to obviously be harder to keep it going. Yes, the size of the board on which we're playing that game is now shrinking. It was 124 degrees today in cities across India. That's too hot. People can't be alive for very long in those kind of temperatures. Um, you know, the scientists tell us that by mid-century on current trajectories, there'll be a big swath of Asia, uh, uh, the North China Plain into the Persian Gulf where people really won't be able to successfully live. That's why the UN predicts there'll be a billion climate refugees this century. Um, so the size of the board on which we play this game is, is shrinking. And I, I alluded to this before, but I mean, the, the reason that we're in such trouble at the moment, I think, or one of them, is that we, we had the bad luck of just at the moment when we most needed sort of human solidarity, we instead stumbled into this cul-de-sac of, um, you know, beginning in the kind of Reagan era of a kind of worship of individualism and, uh, and, and the completely, as it turns out, incorrect idea that markets were going to solve all problems by themselves if we just got out of the way. I talk a fair amount in the book, as you know, about Ayn Rand. She sort of becomes the shorthand for that particular crimped and unpleasant view of the world. And what's hopeful to me is I don't think that actually that view comports with human nature. I don't think that's actually who we are. I think human beings were born and evolved for contact with each other and for contact with the natural world. And I think that given another 50 or 100 years, we'll work through a lot of our current, you know, the sort of some of the kind of actually quite recent uh, uh, kind of nonsense about the consumer world in which we live and get to someplace more interesting. The only thing that worries me is that we don't have 50 or 100 years, so we better, well, we have to figure out how to speed up this transition. And you can begin to see it happen. You know, it's good news that the most popular politician in America in the last couple of years has been our Senator, Mr. Sanders, because his entire uh, you know, entire, the thing that's attractive about him to people is precisely that he stands for that kind of human solidarity. Uh, what was his slogan last time around? Not me, us, you know? Um, um, and, and happily, now you watch all, everybody else in the you know, Democratic Party starting to emulate that. You see equally uh, kind of wonderful uh, stand from Senator Warren or from whoever else. And it's appealing to people catching on. Um, um, there's a narrow, powerful band of self-interest uh, that's kept us locked in some of the things, and, and, the, and it's been, at ju as I said before, at just the wrong moment. Um, you know, the 1980s was when scientists were telling us about climate change, was precisely the moment when we could have used a strong, kind of generous solidarity around the country and around the world as we tried to sort of help each other 
And instead, we got just the opposite. We got the president saying, you know, uh, uh, the, the government is not the solution. The government is the problem. We got Margaret Thatcher saying, there is no such thing as a society. There are only individual men and women. I mean, just a series of exactly the wrong messages. And we're, we will recover from that. The pendulum will swing back the other way, politically and socially. The only danger, deep danger, is that climate change is a timed test. So it, the pendulum could swing back too late you know, to, to deal with it. That's why it's so important that Kai and everybody else is now forcing the spring, as it were, uh, uh, pushing us to move faster than we're kind of going to naturally move. I'd like to talk, I'd like to pick up on that and talk about um, civil disobedience, and you call civil disobedience a technology of repair. You, you talk about two technologies of repair, one being solar power and the other being civil disobedience. Being nonviolent movement building, yes. Uh, yeah. So I think those two actually are the great technological achievements, if you want to call them technologies of the 20th century. I mean, you know, I, I think 200 years from now people will think of nuclear power as a kind of sideshow and, uh, you know, hopefully we will have gotten through some of our fascination with genetics and sort of the other things that we think of as the great 20th century inventions. The solar panel turns out to be, let's talk, can I talk about that for a minute first? Yeah, and, and talk about besides power, what opportunities yeah. there are there. Uh, I just want to talk about, I, one of the happy trips of mine in the last few years has been, uh, and there's been a lot of unhappy trips, you know, I've been off to Greenland and watched it melt and been at, you know, place after watching people Bangladesh and dying and dengue fever and so on. But I, I was spent some time for the New Yorker in Africa, very remote rural parts of Africa um, in recent years, in Ghana, Ivory Coast, then over east into Tanzania. Um, in places where nobody's ever had access to power of any kind. Fossil fuel might as well never have been discovered. It didn't do a lick of good for anybody in these places. Um, and never would. No one's ever going to build the grid out into the rural Ghana. I mean, not in any time frame that matters to anybody. Um, but all of a sudden, the price of the solar panels dropped so sharply, 90% in the last decade, that it's now all of a sudden, people are leapfrogging straight to, and, and when you see people getting power for the first time, you realize how much of it we just take for granted. I remember sitting, we were, we were in, I was in Ghana, and uh, you know, it's next to the equator, so it's really hot all the time, like 95 degrees all the time. We're sitting around with the elders of the community, a bunch of old guys. Um, um, and and I was there because they just had installed a new solar micro grid, about 40 panels, and they, you know, run a little bit of wire to all the 60 or 70 huts in the village, and they had power. And so these old guys are sitting there talking with me, and they keep handing me cold bottles of water to drink, and I, for which I was grateful because I was, you know, sweat. I'm a good Vermonter, you know. This was too hot for me. Um, um, but it took me a good 20 minutes of sitting there to realize in my clueless Western way why they were so proud to be handing me a cold bottle of water until the week before there had never been anything cold in this village ever. I mean, the concept of cold more or less hadn't existed. Um, and, and it sort of struck me that I mean, what a miracle. For us, solar power is something that replaces something else, so it doesn't really change your life. But the fact that you can point a sheet of plate glass at the sun and out the back comes cold and light and information and modernity, that's Hogwarts scale magic, you know. And and if we appreciated it that way, we might bring ourselves to kind of do what we should be doing, which is devote every resource that we have on this earth to putting this stuff up as fast as ever we can, you know, for people who have power now and for people who don't. Um, so, so the solar panel is a great invention, and for me, for my money, the other great invention is the nonviolent social movement. Uh, 
you know, the suffragettes and Gandhi and Dr. King and a million other people over the course of the 20th century worked out how you could organize the small and the many to stand up to the mighty and the few. And, you know, I mean, Rebel Alliance versus the Death Star, you know, and that's the, whether it's the British Empire or, uh, or Exxon, you know, the fight is more or less the same. And, and we don't understand as much as we should about how all that works. There's no sort of West Point equivalent for social movements, you know, there probably should be. But we understand more of it, and the academic literature gets better all the time, and it should be hopeful. One of the things we know now is that it doesn't take 50% of people to win a fight. Uh, the literature, there's a woman now at Harvard named Erica Chenoweth who's done the best work on all this, and from hundreds of examples, her theory is that if you can get about three and a half or four percent of the population really engaged in a fight, that should be enough to win the fight because apathy cuts both ways, right? Like, it's hard to get students at school to walk out for a day, right? But the one thing you're not worried about is that the next day there's going to be a bunch of students who are going to walk out in favor of fossil fuels, you know? I mean, it's not going to happen. So that apathy has in this case been your ally, you know, as well. So, so our job's not impossible. It's hard, but not impossible. And we know that it's not impossible because of what's happened other times. We're coming up next spring on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. There's people in here who remember the first one. 20 million Americans were out in the street on the first Earth Day. That was one in 10 of the then American population. And that turned out to be enough. That was probably the biggest day of protest about anything in American history, and it worked. Uh, Richard Nixon, who had not an environmental bone in his body, signed the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, every act that Donald Trump is now trying to gut, okay? Uh, that's what Richard Nixon signed, because he had no choice. The zeitgeist had changed, uh, you know, now, 10% of our population will be 35 million people. It's gonna be hard work to get them out, but if we do, we'll probably win. And the next chance, as Kai knows, is coming on September 20th. Uh, Greta and Thunberg and her crew, at the end of the last big uh, school climate strike, wrote an open letter asking, saying, time for adults to actually get in on this action too. And I had a little warning this letter was coming, so I co-authored, I authored the kind of response that's been signed by two or three hundred leaders around the world, pledging that September 20th, uh, we'll have an all ages climate strike, and people everywhere will leave their jobs, their retirement communities, or wherever it is, to rally in, in wherever they are, uh, 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 to try and keep building this movement. So, we'll see, I mean, I mean, as I said, we're the antibodies. That doesn't mean we're going to win. Sometimes you get a fever and the antibodies come out and they're not enough and then you die, you know? So that's another possibility here, you know? But, uh, but um, I think we've got a shot. What do you say, Kai? <laughs> do you have any questions, comments? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, it's something that we've already started discussing um, at school and with kind of some surrounding schools, <coughs> and some elementary schools that have kids that are excited to be engaged and um, be educated in something that's going to affect their future, but they're not being taught about. Get closer to the microphone, please. Okay. <laughs> Better? Yes. Okay. Stay there. <laughs> okay, great. Will do. Um, so uh, I'm hoping that we're able to move this um, away from just being a school thing, like you were saying, and invite the whole um, part of the community out in order to make it even big, um, bigger and kind of more community-based walk out and then hopefully have things like that stick into possibly making something happen more regularly. 
Absolutely. I mean, and let's say that you own a restaurant or even a bookstore in Harvard. I mean, Friday, September 20th, we need you to close it for a couple hours and be out, organize, you know, be out. We need everybody out. And it'll, what people do will be, you know, what people are calling for will be different in different parts of the country and different parts of the world as we're doing this. Uh, people will be rallying about different things. Some places where there are active fights about pipelines or coal mines or things, that's what people will be doing. Some places they'll be building bike paths and whatever else. Uh, some places, I think there's going to be a lot of focus on uh, around the world on finance and on you know the handful of banks and things that are providing the resources that allow the fossil fuel industry to keep doing what it's doing. One, one just um, the, the easiest, easiest, and to me, therefore, most maddening thing in Vermont is that, for some reason, our state treasurer uh, has refused to follow the lead of, say, the New York City Pension Fund or the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund or the Anglican Church, or by this point, just an endless list of other institutions that have divested their holdings in, I mean, uh, on our behalf, the state holds lots of stock in Exxon and Chevron and everybody else, and that should stop. And y'all are close enough to Montpelier to exert some uh, pressure on that kind of thing. So there's one possible idea. Um, that divestment movement, which people here have helped with, turns out to have been a real success so far. Where it, with six years in, it's become the biggest anti-corporate campaign in history. We're at $8 trillion worth of endowments and portfolios that have divested in whole or in part from fossil fuel. Shell said last year in its annual report that it had become a material risk to its business. There were interviews a few weeks ago in Politico magazine with the heads of the biggest coal companies in America who essentially said they no longer could raise money for expansion because too many funds had divested from fossil fuel. Uh, the Trump administration a few weeks ago uh, put forward a law to make it more difficult for municipalities to divest from fossil fuel and things, but it hasn't passed yet and people are perfectly capable of doing this and we should be doing it. Kai, what do you, I'm gonna ask a question of Kai. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, what are your biggest challenges as you organize students and the people around them and what support would you ask of your community? Um, so um, in our most recent walkout, there was a lot of pushback from students. Um, there's been a lot of kind of conversation kind of leading into more conflict around um, people thinking that the school is too liberal and so the fact that um, they weren't gonna um, suspend or put kids that walked out in detention was a really big issue for everyone um, so we kind of had to navigate that um, and there's a there's a big unwillingness to learn and listen um, and possibly even change your views based off of new information that you gain. Um, so we're really trying to do the education bit that we can because not everyone is educated on these things at home. And so school is the one opportunity where we have everyone here. Um, but it's, it's definitely a real task to get people to listen to things that they're so stuck in their ways about. And it becomes a big like me versus you thing mm -hmm. instead of we're both in this together this is our future, this is our one thing that we have in common. Mm -hmm. So, um, I guess if you have children, make sure you uh, educate them about the truth of the climate crisis that we're in. And also, um, be active members. <coughs> walk out when there is a walkout. Um, share something on Facebook when you see it. Make sure you're watching Greta kind of stay up to date on the Fridays for Future, because there's a lot of really cool things happening, but we're super isolated, so it's easy to kind of forget about them or not stay in touch with them. So that's the one thing that Thank you. I saw a lot of nods from you. 
Does that mm -hmm. resonate with what you? Absolutely. Organizing is hard work because, I mean, it's good work, but hard work because inertia is the most powerful force in the world. You know? um, left to, if we leave everything to its own devices, change will come at best slowly. Um, and in this case, we need change to come quickly. The fact that climate change is a timed test, first time test that humans have stumbled into, is the most distinctive thing about it. If we don't get the change that we need quickly, then it'll change when it comes, it won't matter. Uh, look, there's no question that 75 years from now, the planet's gonna run on sun and wind because it's more or less free, and in the long run, that will tell, okay? The problem is that if it takes 75 years to get there, the planet that runs on sun and wind will be a bit fundamentally broken planet. It won't work anymore. So the job is to make it happen more quickly. And making things happen quickly is always hard. Human institutions and human beings are better set up to deal with gradual change. That's just who we are. Our problem here, and it's one way to kind of always just that I think I sort of try to keep in the back of my mind because it makes it easier for me to think about it. The problem here is different than usual political, the usual political negotiations are between different groups of people, right? And they have different opinions and, and so they have to kind of hash them out and the right way to deal with that is to reach some kind of compromise. I think the minimum wage should be $30 an hour. You think there shouldn't be a minimum wage? Okay, let's call it 15 and we'll come back in five years and fight some more. That's fine, that's sort of how progress should work. The problem with climate change is the basic, though there are all these other overlying things and you know, environmentalists versus industry and Republicans versus Democrats, whatever. The basic negotiation that's underway is human beings and physics. And that's a difficult negotiation. Physics really doesn't care, you know, isn't participating. It's just doing what it's doing. And so our job is to meet it. And, and that's why, that's why having to figure out how to overcome that inertia is so hard. Um, so I'm always extraordinarily grateful uh, to people who are doing that hard work. Organizing just means talking to your neighbors, to your classmates, getting them to you know uh, 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 do things, and 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 and, and we'll see. I think we have time for a couple of questions if you're willing. And we can repeat them if people can't hear them. Yeah. So. Do you want to call on people? Let me you know you're on. Okay, I see you with a white t-shirt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, in your recent travels, um, it seems that people on the coast seem to understand that the climate's changing, but there's a lot of resistance um, in the um, sort of, I guess for lack of a better term, the red states. And do you see any of that changing in your recent travels? Yeah. Um, look, the polling data around climate change is very interesting. It's always worth remembering that the U.S. is the, almost the only place in the world with a significant community of people who are denied science. Okay? And that's because it's the center of the fossil fuel industry and it's where they've spent the most money and time spreading the, spreading this series of lies. I mean, as I say in the book, and I just go through and establish the, just, to, just, to, just so you have sympathy for why people are the way they are. I mean, we know now from great investigative reporting that the fossil fuel industry knew everything there was to know about climate change in the 1980s. Exxon was the biggest company on earth. It had great scientists. Its product was carbon. Of course they wanted to figure it out. And their scientists told their executives how fast it was going to warm and how much, and their predictions were spot on. Um, uh, their executives believed them. Exxon built every drilling rig that it built from then on to compensate for the rise in sea level they knew was coming. What they didn't do was tell any of the rest of us. They invested 
billions of dollars with all the fossil fuel industry in setting up this architecture of deceit and denial and disinformation. Uh, uh, they, they constructed a completely phony debate about whether or not global warming was real. <coughs> a debate that both sides knew the answer to when it started. It's just that one of them was willing to lie in order to preserve its business model. And it turns out to be the most consequential lie in human history because it delayed us for 30 years. Okay? Now, that lie has a shelf life because if nothing else, Mother Nature is a powerful educator. And Mother Nature has now been hitting us upside the head repeatedly to explain what's going on. 80% of U.S. counties have had a federally declared disaster in the last three years. That explains more than anything else why the polling data now shows that about 70% of Americans are, uh, understand that climate change is a real problem. And at, at this point in our history, to get 70% of Americans to agree on anything is a you know, remarkable shift. Um, it's coming faster in blue states than in red states for a variety of reasons, cultural and economic, but it's coming everywhere. Um, when, when, when Americans get polled about all kinds of things, it turns out the one thing that Americans like across the board, and the thing that polls the highest, is renewable energy. Wind turbines and solar panels get about 80% approval, 80% of people, Republicans, Democrats, and Independents, say we want more of these things and more government support for them. The reasons differ. I think. I mean, I think that there are a certain breed of people who think if I get a solar panel on my roof, I'll never have to speak to another human being again about anything. I'll be in my own fortress. And then there's a lot of other people who think it's like really groovy because we can connect up with everybody in the neighborhood, you know, whatever. These are different impulses, but they lead in more or less the same direction. And it's allowing there to be real progress. So if you go to Iowa, Iowa is now. Iowa and Texas are the two biggest wind producing states in the country now. And this stuff's really popular. Uh, you know, uh, Charles Grassley is the senator from Iowa. Um, he's, a, from my point of view, a troglodyte on almost every issue in the world. But try and take away the producer tax credit for wind, you know, and see who's going to be on your neck, you know. Um, 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 so it's starting to shift, and it's going to shift more. Look at the Midwest right now. We've come through the 12 wettest months in American history. I don't mean to tell Vermonters that, but um, but you know that's because when you warm the atmosphere, it holds more water vapor than cold. So you get both more evaporation and drought in dry areas, and more downpour and deluge in wet areas. You know, we've had some rain, but in the Midwest, they've had biblical rain. I mean, the, the Mississippi has been at flood stage since early January, the longest flood on the Mississippi in history. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of people sitting around their kitchen tables right now trying to figure out whether they're going to be able to plant a crop this year, whether they can get a tractor into the soil, you know, whether they should just cut their losses and try to collect crop insurance this year. Um, and, and so that change will come, you know. Whether it'll come fast enough is hard. Again, remember, don't be too harsh on people because they're dealing with a world where we've, you know, the oil and gas industry has, I mean, the, the Koch brothers, who are the biggest oil and gas parents, purchased one of our two political parties. You know, I mean, they used the ability to kind of warp and distort reality is very, very real. And it takes a while for reality to reassert itself. So that's the best I got. Sir? Yes. Um, the wealth factor, um, non-W2 income, uh, retirement, parents, the, de the Democratic Party, each party has certainly been painted by that. In regards to this issue, would you comment on that? 
I'm missing that a little bit. Well, in, the, in terms of money, in terms of the, uh, it, 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 how, where are we getting our our income from? A lot of it is not from W two. It's from it's from other sources. Well, well much of it's based on uh, the markets and whatnot. And sure, uh, I'm not sure that that means. Look, I mean. So one of the, I think one of the myths about environmentalism in general is that it's the sort of work of the, the affluent white people are, who are environmentalists. But that just turns out not to be, for the most part, true. Uh, the, the groups in the United States that are by far the most concerned about uh, climate change are African Americans and Latino Americans. That's where the level of polling data is through the roof. And it's because they have to deal with the consequences much more directly than the rest of us. On the largest scale, I mean, it, I mean I, look, I mean, name the problem. Uh, affluent white people tend to be um, more the problem than the solution to, you know, whatever it is you're uh, worrying about, climate change uh, among it. So, um, um, I do think that one of the best parts of this Green New Deal legislation that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and others have put forward is that it takes seriously the fact that this is going to be a difficult transition, and it for working people in particular. And that's why this like federal jobs guarantee is so important. That's a part of it. I mean, it says straight up. You want a job helping in the transition to renewable energy? You got it, and at the prevailing wage, and we'll make sure. And that's important. I mean, and it's impossible to penalize coal miners for what they've done um, um, for good and honest reasons with their lives. The good news is there's almost none of them left. Um, the, the coal fields have been so automated that we're now at about 50,000 people mining coal in America. That's not a difficult number for a country of 300 million to figure out how to absorb, to help retrain, put on their feet, uh, give other work to do. So, I, I, you know, but that is why it's important that we're seeing, for the first time, legislation like the Green New Deal that's on the same scale as the problem that we face, not kind of nibbling around the edges of it. Uh, Anne. I'll stand up because I usually can't be heard. Um, so thank you so much for this forum. I see you, Bill, as a, um, as a thought leader, and we certainly need that at this time. I see people like Paul Hawkins as a solution person, so check mm -hmm. us out at the Galaxy, draw down if you want to look at this book. I see people like Mary DeMosser, who's written a book about climate change um, action for families, the climate revolution. Yep as a solutions person, and now I am trying to reflect on what do I as an individual need to do besides joining these larger movements? And I think this is a question we all have to ask ourselves, especially in a state where most of us spend much of our lives driving these hunks of metal around with just one person in our vehicle. So I feel like transportation in Vermont is one of the biggest areas for change that would be meaningful and essential. I'm wondering if you know of any um, rural areas, because neither of the books that I cited really address this, but rural areas that have developed some kind of online drive board for carpooling or some other modern ways that we can yeah, talk with each other's drive boards. So these are good, it's a very good question. And it is Vermont's great contribution to climate change at this point. I mean, we've been we've done some good work in this state. Like most of it started a long time ago. Um, um, uh, sometimes I think that Vermont's green cred really rests on stuff that was done in the like Madeleine Kunin administration, and we've been kind of coasting since, um, as the most recent session of the legislature would remind us. Um, 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 uh, so we've done good things like Efficiency Vermont that's really been useful in helping change the way that we use energy and things, especially industrial. But transportation is our a, a great bugaboo because of the way that, I mean, it's the most rural state in the union and a 
collection of villages, so it's hard. But there are places that have done, that are doing pretty interesting things with rural transit. Um, Addison County, where I live, actually has a good transit network through Addison County. I live up in Ripton, which is at the you know high end of the county, altitude altitude wise. And you know, six or eight times a day, a bus trundles by on the way up, not only to the snow bowl, the ski area, but it goes all the way to the top of Middlebury Gap before it turns around. And there's always a hiker or two coming off the long trail or going the other way. But of course, most of the bus routes are down in the valley, and you know, people getting back and forth from the Burrito Virgins to wherever they're going. So it can be done. We obviously need. Um, train service again in a serious way. I mean, if, you, if you look around Vermont, you can tell that our uh, ancestors had it much better in this regard. Most towns in Vermont have a train depot someplace that's now either a microbrewery or an art gallery. That's okay. right. There you are. Um, 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 and, and much as I love microbreweries, and as much as I occasionally enjoy art galleries, um, um, we'd be good to have some trains back too, so that we that was an option. And since we're still going to be using private vehicles, it makes all the sense in the world to be com quickly converting them to electric vehicles, which is now a real possibility. Uh, 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 electric vehicles not only are useful because you can run them if you've built the renewable energy capacity off the sun and the wind, but also because they become then the bulwark of a kind of grid storage system. Um, you know, a Vermont with 30,000 electric vehicles parked in garages is a, is a Vermont with a massive energy storage system that can be drawn back and forth across the grid. We've already got some of that. Green Mountain Power did a good job of distributing those Tesla Powerwall things over the last few years. There's 2,500 homes or something in the state that bought them at a discount from Green Mountain Power. And the result was that we all saved hundreds of thousands of dollars last summer because when we reached the electricity peaks, GMP was able to just draw on the power that was in people's batteries for a few hours and avoid paying the enormous peak prices that come with energy. So there's things we can do, um, and we should be doing, and we're really not doing. I was sort of teasing about the legislature a minute ago, but I gotta say, we need them working faster and harder than they're working too. It's not okay to kind of end the legislative session and say, well, we'll get to climate change next year. Uh, we've got, what do we say now, 11 years or something to make really substantial progress just crossing one of them off because you couldn't, you know, get whatever it was out of the committee or get the progressives and the Democrats to agree on what, I mean, it's not okay anymore. We actually really need to concentrate on some of this stuff and get it done. So there's, there really is work around transportation that we could be doing, I think, quite quickly. And it's fun to watch the parts of the world where it's happening. I would just say, people sometimes think, oh, there's no use doing anything in this country because China and India are, China and India are doing this work. There was a story the other day, there's 300 electric buses now in the United States. There are 395,000 electric buses in China. Okay. Uh, 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 that's who's gonna own the future as we're you know, going this way. I'm gonna um, bring us to a close and invite anybody who has questions and wants to chat further with Bill to do so when he's signing books in the lobby. Um, I have just a few closing remarks. I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. I want to thank you, Bill, for your book. Um, Kai, I so appreciate being here with you and for all the work that you're doing. Um, and Bill, I want to say that the last page of your book is the most moving and powerful of any I've read. Um, it, for me, it recasts the entire book as a declaration of love and the kind of love that brings us together as we are here tonight as a human family. And I hope you'll all buy the book, specifically from the Galaxy Bookshop, <laughs> as I did. Um, 
honestly, I was terrified to read the book, and I was often terrified when I was reading it, but it was all worth it, so thank you. <laughs> um, towards the end of the book, you write, let's assume we're capable of acting together to do remarkable things. And I want to thank you for bringing us together tonight and for living your faith in humanity. Well, Linda, let me say, first of all, thanks to you for all of it. I mean, I, I, I know enough about this community to know what a role you've played in making it work and thrive and become a creative and interesting place in recent years. So that's a model for all of us in Vermont. And thank all of you for working at it. And, and thanks to Kai enormously. I'm happy to go sign books, selling books is interesting and we really should support bookstores and so on and so forth. But the most useful thing that can happen out of this event tonight is for people to start getting organized across the community for this thing on September 20th. I, I've said it before, but I will say it again. It is not the responsibility of high school juniors to save the planet. Okay? In a rational world, high school juniors wouldn't even be asked to, I mean, they'd get to concentrate on all the things that you concentrated on when you were a high school junior, which had nothing to do with saving the planet at all. Okay? Or maybe didn't concentrate yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, um, we should be incredibly grateful that high school juniors are willing to do this work at the moment, and we should demonstrate our gratitude by making sure that we are absolutely standing with them.